Greetings, I'm glad that you're uh, tuning in today, and it's been a few weeks since we, we recorded and since we've been here, and so, um, you know, I apologize, we had some technical difficulties and, and uh, getting some of the recordings done, and so, anyhow, as we, uh, as we begin today, would you pray with me, and let's, uh, let's just invite God to join us and speak to us through His Word, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the, your word and the way that it challenges and actually for those times when, Lord, when we kind of have to wrestle with what you say and how, how does that, what do you mean? And in those moments, I pray that it would be your Holy Spirit that kind of speaks through the noise, speaks through the confusion even, that we would come to know you better and understand you more. Lord, I know your word is alive. I know that sometimes it cuts to our very soul. And I pray that you would do that today. That you'd speak to us through this and that you'd help us to draw close to you in the midst of it, okay? Please help us. But I say all that and what I really what I wa- really want to pray for is, is your will be done. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, as we begin today, I want to just do a, a, a little, it's going to be a little bigger review. And, and the reason why it's a little bigger review is last week's passage was kind of tough, and, and uh, um, I, it's still kind of been, I've been trying to process it and try to figure a, a li- even deeper understanding of it, and as I prepared for today, it seemed like the two kind of needed to come together, and so L- Luke chapter 16, it's, it's, it's really challenging chapter, not necessarily in its teaching as much as just our understanding of it. And so I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not just thinking about it last week. I'm, I'm talking about this week, too. I think next week's passage is a little bit easier to comprehend, all right? But, but last week and then it added to this week. Um, so it was a difficult passage and uh, uh, about the shrewd manager. And, and I'm actually, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm being kind to him by calling him the shrewd manager. He was actually the lazy cheating manager. It's probably more accurate. Um, I shared with you that there is more in that parable than, than we uh, were going to cover. And my hope was that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts as I, as I drew a, our attention to just some of the details in the parable and some of the details in that passage. And so um, we had the wasteful manager and we had a wealthy master and then we had the debtors, right? Those are the, those are the, character, the only characters really in the story. So we see the manager uh, develop this scheme to ensure his survival, right? Cutting a deal with the master's debtors, creating an airtight solution for him, for himself. Uh, A huge favor for the debtors, but a terrible loss to the master. What What a strange and difficult story. And I believe what makes it difficult is that that Jesus is is not only just speaking to the disciples, because we're told he was talking to the disciples, but he's also speaking to the Pharisees. And so he's got these two audiences, and as he speaks, he has this ability, right? His wonderful ability to speak to several different people and and people groups at the same time. And, uh, I mean, he's a master at communication. Let's let's be honest, right? But so as he's speaking to the disciples that are listening to him... um, it would, it's possible it would leave them struggling with a, with a master commending the manager, right? I mean, that, as a disciple, that's probably one of the places we should be is, is this wrestling with, ah, the master commended this manager. Well, what's the deal with that? And Jesus uses this parable to draw out what's in our hearts. I mean, th- this is what he does with parables is he draws out what's in our hearts. As I listen to, to that parable, it, there's this real struggle with how is this, I mean, how is this good? I mean, there isn't a good guy in the story, right? It, I mean, if you continue to read, Jesus goes on to talk about money and, uh, and the way that it can begin to rule us and control us. Instead, we need to see money or, or, and whatever blessing that God has, uh, has given with this realization that God expects us to use His blessings to further the advancement of his kingdom. Now, what, the way he worded it, wor- use worldly wealth in your favor so that when, uh, w- when, when it's gone, you've secured for yourself eternal dwellings. That's a really strange statement, but if, you, if we just listen, 
what he's saying is, is, is hey, the, the blessings we, we're given, they're for eternal purposes. Are we using them for that? Are we furthering his kingdom? Advancing God's kingdom is like ensuring for yourself places, a place to live. When we're called to answer the call, to account for the way we've lived. So the tension this creates, all right, that this parable, there is a tension that it creates. It leads me to believe that, that Jesus wants us to realize just how foreign this is to us. I mean, because the story, that, that response, what the, what the manager did with the master's possessions, that response is so, um, so strange to us. It's foreign to us. We look at the manager and we think, how is that a good thing, right? And, and that is just, that's just as strange. It's just as strange as spending our resources on his kingdom instead of ours. Okay, so as we hear that story and we go, man, that, how can that be? You know, that doesn't, doesn't seem good, right? That, that gut feeling, if we just kind of bring it over to, here's the problem, naturally, our response is not to advance God's kingdom. Our response is to build our kingdom. The manager took seriously the situation he was facing and did what needed to be done to secure his future. Setting up a retirement plan, making good investments. I mean, that's, that's what we should be doing, right? Ah, Jesus calls, it on, calls us on that. We've all been wasteful. We've all been wasteful stewards or managers of God's possessions. We are in a similar predicament, and Jesus shows us that the right thing to do is, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? The, the right thing to do is, is really kind of goes against what our, our gut reaction. When money gets tight, man, we conserve, right? When we think about we're closer to retirement, we start saving up, and we try to figure out ways to secure that. But, but what he's saying is, is that, but we're just talking about a flash in the pan here. Think about eternity. Where are you spending these resources? It's just as this idea of, of investing in the kingdom is just as foreign as, as, as we read the passage and the manager treating the master like he did. I mean, if the manager's response is difficult for you and for me to appreciate, maybe it's a sign that money masters you more than you think. Now, I say that because I think that's where I'm wrestling. And I, th and I see that that's, that's kind of that one of the messages that's going on in there. So now he's talking also to the Pharisees. He knows the Pharisees are listening, right? They're, they're looking back at him, and they got their nose up in the air. They're sneering at him. And Jesus tells us, tells us what's in their hearts, right? Jesus straight up rebukes them. You justify yourselves, he said. You listen to this story, and you appreciate the manager's response. There is something in the story that the Pharisee appreciated, and Jesus lets them know they are absolutely wrong. Now, this is strange, right? So if we don't appreciate the story and we struggle with it, God, Jesus is revealing something in us, right? But if we do read the story and we appreciate it, what he's doing is he's revealing something in us. See, he's a master communicator here. There is something here that, that Jesus is pressing on the Pharisees. What they loved in the story wasn't the details that Jesus was using to instruct the disciples. Right? What they loved about the story is this, is the very thing that God detests. They loved the commendation. The, the, the manager had found a way around the expectations of the master. Do you hear that? That the manager figured out a way around the master. The Pharisees did that often. They were given the law and the prophets, and they found the loopholes in it. And, and, and it, it, in, they didn't say that, but that's what they were doing. They came up with their laws. They came up with their teachings. It was called the Mishnah. It was written down, the Pharisaic teachings. It was their explanation of God's law. And so they listen to the story, and then because of Jesus' response to them, what we see is there's something in that story they liked. A Pharisee was an expert in God's law, so along with the expertise, they interpreted it. 
And they found those loopholes just like the manager found a loophole. Or they thought they found loopholes. The Pharisees teaching interpretation. The Mishnah, okay? Now, the truth that contradicts the Mishnah, that was the problem that they wrestled with. And Jesus would teach, and it, confl- it never conflicted with the law, but it, always, it oftentimes conflicted with the Pharisees' teachings. When Jesus does this, we are usually clued in to what is going on by the reaction of the Pharisees. In fact, if we think back a couple chapters, right, Jesus was invited to a Pharisee's house, and he didn't wash his hands, the ceremonial washing of his hands. And the Pharisees were sitting there thinking, why hasn't he done this, right? Truth against their teachings. Their love of money shaped their interpretation of the law and how they heard the story Jesus that that Jesus tells and this is what he says you have you value highly what God detests as Christ is formed in us we we need to take a serious look at at how we're using the blessings God has given us I mean is our focus on our comfort our kingdom or on God's plan and God's kingdom I, I would love to be able to tell you Give this much to this ministry, and, and you're good. But that isn't what Jesus does here. He calls his disciples to be on our guard and be aware that we have inherited a tendency to love money and become a slave to it. But he has come to, to set us free, and freedom is found in making God the Father our master. Not money, not ourselves, but God the Father. I know that I know that was a long review, okay? But that's kind of what we looked at last week, okay? Now, I wanted to highlight a few things because, because what happens in our next passage, all right? So today's passage could seem a little out of place, a, a, a little odd because, uh, because it doesn't seem to fit with what Jesus had, had been just saying. Now, when we get there, you'll see what I mean, right? It just, in fact, in my Bible... Um, as we just take a first glance at it, my Bible has this little heading above it, additional teachings of Jesus, right? In in fact, what happens is the interpreter or whoever comes in and puts these little headings above these passages, uh, they came along and they're like, well, these these statements, they don't don't fit with what he just said, so we're going to just put them separate, right? As I looked at this, I began to see, I think, that this stuff is all connected, right? I mean, Luke, Luke's not, not an amateur here. Luke is an educated man. He gathered information, he did the research, and he placed stories where he felt like they worked to communicate the gospel the way that it needed to be communicated to the people he was writing to. He was meticulous. So it doesn't seem likely that, that these next two verses are, are misplaced or just randomly placed here but i'm going to tell you if we read along we could almost look at that as wow that just kind of gets sandwiched in between two stories here i'm going to assume that's not what was happening i'm going to assume that luke actually meant to put them here because it connects with this whole thing that jesus is teaching and it goes deeper than just our money all right so let's approach this passage as though it is connected to the parable before it and that it's connected to the story after it. Because here's the deal. The story after it and the story before it, they are talking about what comes next, after life. Jesus is talking about where is our eternity? Are we preparing for it? Are we ready? Have we been, have we been taking note of what's in front of us and taking advantage of it? He's wanting people to be part of heaven, but he's giving this warning. And so sometimes we, you know, we read too casually and we just kind of jump right over it. And so I like the fact that this story caused me to go, what? Right? Not, not even this part, but even last week. I'm glad that it caused me to go, Anna, I just don't understand it. Because when I do that, what happens is, is then I stop and I start to look at it a little closer. And as I slow down, I realize, man, Jesus is, Jesus is teaching us something 
that we need to take note of, that we need to notice. And we're talking about eternal things, not just this temp- the temporary things for this life. And so listen to what he says here, all right? It's just two little verses. It says this. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached, and everyone is forcing their way into it. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery, and the man who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Luke 16, 16 through 18. That's, and and that's, that's what we're given. Now, I've got to tell you, it feels like he just kind of jammed several things right together, right? I mean, he talks about uh, John, the, king, the law of the prophets, the kingdom. He talks about uh, uh, the word of God is going to remain. And then he talks about divorce and adultery. I mean, it, it's, it's just, it almost seems a little bit random. But, but let's just jump right in, okay? Because it, it's not random. All right, so as we do, as we process it, the first thing I want us to do is I want us to recognize Jesus here, he identifies the watershed moment in history, okay? And I say the watershed moment in history. Now think about what had happened here. There had been 400 years of silence. All of a sudden, John shows up on the scene, and he's prophesying. He is a prophet, and we would say he's, even though it's in the New Testament, he really is kind of an Old Testament prophet in the style of Old Testament prophets. See, up until John, the law and the prophets were proclaimed. I mean, even in the silent years, the 400 years between uh, Malachi and, 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 and John showing up, this law and the prophets was still being proclaimed. The Pharisees were doing that. They, were, they, had, learnt, they had sort of learned their lesson, and they wanted to make sure that, that God's law was, people knew it and studied it. And so up until John, the law and the prophets had been proclaimed. But it's John that's the critical moment. I mean, if you're wondering, how did this transition, Old Testament, New Testament, if you're wondering, you know, how did, the, how did this, you know, Messiah, how did Jesus kind of break into the world John is the moment, a a watershed moment here. 2,000 years later, man, it's easy for us to have a little understanding of the significance here, right? Uh, But but God, through John, breaks the silence, all right? 400 years, and all of a sudden, John starts to speak God's word. And when he breaks the silence... It is to usher in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is at hand. There is a huge difference between these two eras, between the law and the prophets and the kingdom. They're not separated, they're just, there's a huge difference between them. See, Israel was expecting this huge change, all right? I mean, that's what they were waiting for. That's what they were watching for. They were watching for, the, for God to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. They had this huge expectation of what I would say is a physical change. Their whole mindset was, how was Israel going to be positioned in the world? That's a physical change they wanted to have take place. See, but, but God, was, God was changing the spiritual condition of the world. This is what was happening. I mean, if, if behind the scenes, underneath, on in the in the dimension of the spiritual, not the physical, so much was changing. So much so that we would say that this is this this is this watershed moment, okay? Where all of a sudden it doesn't flow onto this side, it flows onto this side, if you can think of it that way. His kingdom was being instituted was advancing. It was no longer the kingdom of Israel. It was now God's kingdom breaking through. The law and the prophets instructed his people what sin is and what they needed to do to account for their sins. Right? The good news of the kingdom, see, it doesn't do away with sin, it, but it continues the story. So this watershed moment, recognize what it is. It is a spiritual change, complete spiritual change. John is the the, kind of the marker. 
physically we maybe didn't see the change but spiritually it was there listen to what paul says in in romans chapter 8 he says this for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh god did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be in a be a, a sin offering and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be full, fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So you hear what Paul's talking about? He's talking about the, this moment that everything changed. Something needed to change. God knew that, that the law and the prophets was not the solution. It was just a piece of the story. Something needed to change. And, and God is, and excuse me, John is the sign of that change taking place. We want to think about like moments like this. Let's take a little teeny moments because this is a huge one, right? Physical watershed moments in, in, our, in, in our lifetime, in our recent history. 9-11 would be a watershed moment. Here's what I mean by that is, is that since 9-11, everything has been different, right? I mean, just simply travel is different. Do you remember the days when you could take your the one the one that you loved? They were traveling, you weren't. You could walk to the the gate, and you could watch them walk onto the plane, and then you could watch the plane take off. Remember those days? Remember where you could show up just a few moments before the plane was loading, and uh, you didn't have to worry really have to worry much about security. What about the days when you could stand at the gate and wait for your loved ones to come off the plane? I liked those moments, actually. Those, those don't exist anymore. Everything changed from there. How about the coronavirus, right? <laughs> we don't know what it's going to go back to, but I'll tell you what, it's not going back to the same that it was. See, those, are, those seem like sig significant events in our lifetime. But that is nothing compared to what Jesus is telling us. That is nothing compared to the event that happens here. The kingdom of God has broke through. We may not see it physically, but within the spiritual dimension, everything has changed. The good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. What's the news that's good? What, what do we find in the kingdom of God that is good? The kingdom of God is here. It has arrived. All of creation has been groaning since the fall of man. Finally, God has broke into the mess. Now, there's more to the good news, but, but we'll come back to that in just a little bit, okay? But, but let's move on to this next phrase that Jesus says. It's extremely difficult to understand, uh, I think, and, and especially within the context of it. But we find these words are recorded in Matthew and in Luke. Very similar. The settings are slightly different, but each setting, when he talks about um, men are forcefully taking hold of it, right? Um, everyone is forcing their way into it. Those are the words we used. The setting's a little bit different, but, but the issues are, deal, are still the same. He's talking about John, and, and John is that pinnacle moment, all right? They're both connected with John and, and spreading of the good news about the kingdom of God. Listen, listen to, here's what we read in Luke. It says this, uh, and everyone is forcing their way into it. How does that, how does that sound to you? I mean, what, 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 is that, what picture does that create in you? Because I read that, and I'm like, what does that mean? It's, it's a little bit difficult. So let's look at what he says in Matthew. And, and Matthew writes this. He says this. And, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been treated violently, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied with John. Until John, excuse me. Until John. Uh, what? Violent men have been taking hold of it? 
taken by force the, the difficulty seems to to come with this idea of force and violence right is i mean we, what we hear is is this is a significant thing that that's being taken place in in the kingdom of god in the spiritual dimension i mean it almost sounds like the people are just forcing their way into the kingdom A runaway train almost God's kingdom right God's kingdom and violent men seem to be at the opposite sides of the spectrum I want to wrestle with this phrase for a moment and here's why I don't think we have a, a, as good of an understanding of God's kingdom as we should I think we possibly have underestimated what God is doing even today in regards to his kingdom. Because it's not something we necessarily see. We we discredit or we disregard it. But the most powerful kingdom in all of creation and all of time is moving and advancing. Jesus is telling us this. Hey, we hit that moment. Everything's changed. So I don't think we always have this understand, a good understanding of God's kingdom. Scholars admit this is a difficult statement to understand. And, and to add to the difficulty of, of interpreting it, it, the Greek word used that has been interpreted as, as forcing violently this is the only time in Scripture that it's used. We don't have any other places that we can kind of compare it to to be able to say, oh, well, this is kind of, it, it adds a little more body to it to be able to understand it. And so let me share the best two options that, that I found as I kind of studied through this and I, and I sifted through scholars' writings that kind of will help understand this statement. Now remember, Jesus was, uh, has an audience of disciples here and he has Pharisees. So he's talking to two different groups. And, and I presented this idea earlier that, that Jesus has a way of presenting a story and, and speaking to a crowd. And as he speaks to the crowd, he's layered what he says. Is he's able to somehow choose the words right that he's talking to the disciples about something going on in them. And he's talking to the Pharisees about something that's going on in them. And so, once again, Jesus is speaking to both groups and, and he's challenging them to change, to a new life. So, so as we interpret it, okay, we'll give you option one, all right? And uh, this will hopefully will help us maybe understand this passage, all right? So Jesus is, is saying that the people must actively, aggressively, and forcibly seek entrance into the kingdom. Now, somewhere along the way, this ties with what Jesus has said here. Okay, so if we understand it this way, as we read that passage, if we, can, if we interpret it this way, somewhere along the way, Jesus is basically saying, hey, to be part of God's kingdom, it's going to take some action on your part. You don't enter the kingdom of God because you're a good person. You aren't simply born into God's kingdom because, you know, your family goes to church. Jesus' is teaching about the kingdom indicates the importance and difficulty of taking hold of the kingdom. Right? So in Jesus' teaching, he, show, he talks about, hey, this isn't easy. This isn't just something you just you know, accidentally happens, by chance happens. It is something that is intentional. Look at, as we look at just maybe some of the things that he said over his ministry, right? The first thing, he talked about being born again. We find that in uh, John chapter 3, Right? For those of us who have witnessed or been part of childbirth, it involves the whole person, doesn't it? And, and forcibly, I think maybe is, is, is a word that could be used in that picture. I mean, it is a, it's, it's a quite an event. What about this one? He goes on. He goes, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to, to, to sin, pluck it out. If you hear the, the, the tone here, I mean, there, there's some pretty significant action that he was requiring. We could go on. 
Uh, we looked at it a couple couple chapters ago in Luke chapter 14. That, that unless you, you know, hate your brother and sister, your 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 mother, your father, your your own children, and it, he's comparing our love for them to his their our love for him. But do you hear the language? What about this one? Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. There's a difficulty of taking hold of the kingdom of God. How about when he, he talks about giving up everything for the treasures is, is hidden in the field. That's the, the, the story of the pearl of great price. What about when he talks to the rich young ruler? Right? What does he tell him? Why don't you go sell everything and come follow me? I mean, radical action was required of the rich young, young, young ruler. Uh, we looked, once again, a couple chapters ago, we, we looked at counting the cost of building the tower or, or waging war. Effort, it requires like some, our, our whole being, being involved in this. Too often we want the blessing of the kingdom, but not willing to do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. So as Jesus talks to his disciples, He's talking to the, the people in his crowd. One of the things he's speaking about, he says, we read it last week, to use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwelling. It's work. Think about it. Plan. Plan. The kingdom of God is something you want to be part of. But it doesn't just happen by being in the right place at the right time. It requires us to, to be changed. It requires us to, to get off our backside and get engaged in it. I, I believe this is an accurate understanding of the kingdom of God. And, and it seems to work with what, what Jesus has been teaching in this context, right? However, we remember, the Pharisees are sitting back there and they're sneering at Jesus and, and they've been hearing something different. So the, the disciples, they're listening and they're like, oh, you know, and oh, and they're being challenged. And, but the Pharisees are hearing something that's stirring up something inside of them. So, so there seems to be this, this other layer that we would maybe really do well to understand. And honestly, it, I think it'll help us with kind of what he says at the last part. So it kind of helps to, to, to see how it all fits together. Okay, so option two as we look at this. Option two, that uh, um, God doesn't contradict himself, okay? So the law and the prophets can't be at odds with the good news of the kingdom of God. So remember, he goes on to say something to the effect of, you know, not a, not a line, not a dot, nothing will fall away from the Word of God. Heaven and earth could pass away before the Word of God disappears. And so within that understanding, kind of what he's talking is he talks to the Pharisees, right? Is that, hey, what he's teaching and the kingdom of God, it doesn't disregard the law and the prophets. So in order to help us a little bigger, uh, a little better, we need to, we need to address the, the Greek a little bit more here, okay? So to kind of hear, the, the educated people are going to pick up on this in, in Jesus' crowd. So the Pharisees are going to get this a little bit more. But he, if we, let's just, to start, let's look at the literal translation of, of, of Jesus' words here. Now, literal translations, this is what this is, okay? It's just... This is the Greek word, here's the English word. Here's the Greek word, here's the English word. It's in Greek sentence structure, not English sentence structure. And so as we read it, it's a little bit challenging to kind of put it together. But if because we've already read it in the translation, um, you'll, hear, you'll hear it, all right? We just end up moving words around in our heads so it makes sense. The law and the prophets, until John, from that time, the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone into it is forcing, forces his way. Okay, let me read it again. The law and the prophets, until John, from that time, the kingdom of God is proclaimed, and everyone into it forces his way. Okay? 
kind of it's kind of Yoda esque as he speaks, right? Uh, so as we look at this translation, forces his way, his way into it, forces his way. That's the word that 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 we get in Matthew that, that's used violent, violently. That's the word we get used here as, as forces. It's a it's a Greek word, and I cannot even pronounce it. Okay. But uh, there it is. It starts with a B. B I A Z A Z E T A I. I could guess at it, but I'm not gonna. All right. So when you look at up the meaning of that word that we've translated into forcing his way, here's the definitions we get. Number one definition we get is, I use force, force my way, come forward violently. Okay. Do you hear kind of the the possessive? in there it is me i'm the object and the kingdom is the thing that i'm uh i am applying against but the same word could also mean i am forcibly treated suffer violence so you see what happens is the 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 um the direction changes it's either I'm the one doing the action or I'm the one receiving the action. So as Jesus talks to the disciples, he's talking to them about you need to get up and get to work. As he talks to the Pharisees, there's a whole different perspective here. So let me jump to the point. As the Pharisees are listening, these experts in the law, and they're, they're experts at interpreting the law, Jesus may be telling them everyone everyone will be pressed up against the kingdom of God. That, that the kingdom of God is going to press against you. So within the context of what Jesus has been saying, right, the good news of the kingdom of God is the fulfillment of the law. The good news of the kingdom of God is the fulfillment of the law. You've been floundering, let's be honest, you guys, you, you've been floundering all this time. I mean, you've been trying to, to figure out what the law means and what it looks like and how to live about it. You've, you've written a book uh, you know, to, of interpretation of it to help people. But now it's being fulfilled. And with the fulfillment of the law, what ends up happening is, in, in Paul's language, is we're introduced to the law of grace. Now that sounds wonderful law of grace but there's a warning here okay the law of grace has now come into place the kingdom of god the law of grace is here but it's by okay it is by that standard that we will be judged by the gospel of grace everyone is measured We are subject to the standard of the gospel. Everyone is pressed against the gospel of grace. As opposed to being religious. See, leading up to that time, they had enforced or, or pressed up against the, the people, the law and the prophets. And they said, this is what it looks like to, to follow God and be right with God. See, the Pharisees had had made the law and the prophets into something. But we do, we do not actively force ourselves into God, into the gospel, but everyone is subject to the standard of the gospel. There's no way around it. God's plan is perfect. And the good news about his kingdom means this is the good news, that we will all be held to the standard within his kingdom. The teachings that Jesus taught. And it isn't contrary to the law and the prophets. It's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. So as we look at this passage, we, we wrestle with that, that forcing their way, but, but he continues on and he makes these other statements. You know, the, the, the word of God, that, that heaven and earth will disappear before the the word of God changes. We serve a God that never changes. 
He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The picture of God in Jesus doesn't mean that God changed his mind about how he was going to treat people. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So as Jesus speaks to his listeners, we can have a confidence that the law and the prophets don't contradict the good news of the, of the kingdom of God. To hold, to, he told his followers, look, he, he, didn't come to, he didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. Remember, the Pharisees struggled with Jesus' teachings. They, they always felt like he was teaching contrary to Scripture, but all he was doing is teaching contrary to what their interpretation of Scripture. They were upset because his teaching contradicted the Mishnah, but never contradicted the law and the prophets. When we come to a place when, when Scripture doesn't line up with our lives and that Scripture doesn't line up with what we, this picture of God that we've created, we're the ones that are wrong. I've said that over and over again. We need to change. See, what was going on, there's a difference between the law and the prophets versus the Pharisees' teaching. This last statement, it took me a little bit off guard because it seems like a, a strange placement. Right? He, he goes on to talk about divorce and, and, and uh, um, adultery. Jesus had just been speaking about money and it being our master. And then he, then he talks about the, the, the watershed moment. And then he makes a statement regarding adultery. And it's like, what? Where? That's kind of out of left field, right? Maybe there was a, a, we could assume, maybe there was a Pharisee in the, in the crowd that was in the midst of getting a divorce. I, you know, is that it? No, I don't think so. Let me give you a little bit of background here, okay? Within the teaching of Jesus' day, there were acceptable teachings that were happening. That, that it was okay for a man to divorce his wife for a good reason. Now, if we go back, Jesus, Jesus made some clarifications. So the only, only place that uh, allows for, for divorce was, was infidelity. Okay? But in the process of the Pharisees kind of interpreting what the law said, by the, point of, by the time that Jesus showed up, there was a significant understanding, teaching that was taking place, the Pharisees were teaching, that you just had to have a good reason for divorce. And there were more conservative interpretations, and then there were some pretty liberal cons interpretations. And, and it actually had, the liberal ones had gained the most momentum. So among the teaching of Jesus' day, a good reason to get a divorce could be if your wife added too much salt to a broth, right? I mean, if her cooking was bad, that's good enough reason for divorce. Uh, and in fact, it had gone to the next level is, is uh, if you find somebody that you think is more attractive and you'd rather be with, there's a good reason for divorce. And not only if you divorce them and marry somebody else, you're in an issue, but now you've also made anybody that marries your spouse an adulterer as well. That's what Jesus says. And that's what the law taught. But what the Pharisees had been teaching, these little loopholes of ways around it, oh well, for good reason. These were the interpretations of the Pharisees. This is what was found in the Mishnah. What Jesus says here conflicts with the Pharisees' teaching concerning divorce. Okay, that's what's happening. The reason he brings it up is because he's talking about the way God's kingdom works and the way they're operating are so different. Jesus uses the example of marriage as an example of the way the law and the prophets will not change. That those pharisaical teachings were wrong. See, Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets and to show us what, what it actually looks like to live according to the law and the prophets. Jesus lived according to the law and the prophets. So as we step back and we, we listen to the message of Jesus for his disciples, okay, he tells us, strain toward God's kingdom. It's where you want to be. 
It's completely worth it. But, do you, but you will need to be intentional about it. Grab a hold of it. Enter into it. You will find me. If you seek me with all your heart. Do you hear that language? We'll find him if we will seek him. Jesus comes along and he goes, hey, here, here's what it looks like. It's doable. In fact, I'm going to give you my spirit so that you can do this. But for the Pharisees, he says, be careful. You think you've got this figured out, but along the way, you've made scripture suit you. You have found what you think are the loopholes and, and you have developed for yourself a, a religion based on actions. The kingdom of God is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And it can be described. What it means to be part of it, it can be described. It's in the greatest two commandments. What would Jesus says? The, the law and the prophets are all summed up in loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. These are the characteristics of the kingdom. And that's what we will be pressed up against and measured against. That's what is our measurement. As he speaks to the Pharisees and speaks to every one of us. That's what we will be measured against. That's what will be pressed against us. Now, as we shift a little bit and we go into this thought of Christ formed in me, um, this illustration popped into my head, and I, and I think it fits here, okay? And it, when I was a kid, every fall we would go to the shoe store and, and get new shoes. And, you know, I think buying shoes then and buying shoes now are a little bit different, but, but uh, um, because all kinds of places carry shoes now, right? But, but I can remember going to the shoe store every fall before, you know, before school and get a new pair of shoes. Oh, I loved getting new shoes. I still love getting new shoes, but, you know, back then, new shoes, they made me run faster, and so I loved getting new shoes. But we'd go into the shoe store, and, and we'd sit down, and, and we, you know, eventually the clerk would come around, and he'd bring that, that thing. Do you know, you know what I mean? That, that funny-looking contraption, and, and uh, you, he'd put your foot in it, and he'd force the heel down to the back, and then, and then he'd slide the side over, and he'd bring the top down, and, and then he would have you do this next thing. He or she. Stand up. See, because the measurement didn't really count if you weren't standing. Things change in your feet when you stand, apparently. It was only an accurate measurement when you were pressed up against that measure instrument. Jesus goes to say, John started it, and Jesus continues preaching the kingdom of God. John started it, but God's kingdom began to move. And the kingdom of God was pressing against the crowd. And they were being measured. The sinners, the tax collectors, the disciples, and the Pharisees. They all heard the same words. But they were all being measured differently. Do you know what I mean? Is that inside, the way that we respond to the message is the measurement of the kingdom of God. How we measure up. And it continues today. The kingdom of God is like that device. It's only when you're pressed up against it will the measurement be accurate. And we will be pressed up against it. So the question becomes, what are you willing to, be, to do to be part of this kingdom? I mean, as we begin to process through this passage, the question that comes to my mind is, just: so what are you willing to do to be part of God's kingdom? So we go back to last week, and he said, sell, I mean, he didn't say, he said, use worldly wealth, right, to gain friends, so that when, they're, when it's gone, you may enter into eternal dwelling. What are you willing to do to be part of his kingdom? 
And if your answer is <laughs> as little as possible, the measurement's not going to be great. So as I listen carefully to Jesus' words, my perspective continues to kind of adjust. See, as I begin to look at what he's saying, and I begin to have this picture of being of the kingdom of God pressed up against me. I begin to think a little bit differently about the way things go in my life. See, each day we are faced with challenges. What if? What if those challenges are, are, are actually God's kingdom being pressed up against us? I mean, we look at those challenges as our, our relationships, uh, our finances, our, our health, the, the, the culture and society we live in, our opinions, how they conflict sometimes. And, and, but in reality, we are faced with difficulties within our soul. What if? What if we began to look at it this way? Those things that we face each day, that cause conflict in us, those, face, those things we face each day that are, 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 are difficulties, challenges, they're not just random events and simple consequences of our decisions. They are us being pressed up against the kingdom of God. And we're faced with the choice. Will we conform to his kingdom or will we keep fighting? Will we conform to his kingdom or will we keep fighting it? And it's an issue of surrender. Will you surrender everything? This is where we started. He hit, with, he hit it on money. But it continues to kind of, as he goes through this, this teaching, will you surrender everything? Will you open your eyes and see that you are faced with choices throughout your day? Today, you will be faced with this. Will you surrender to what he is doing and accept his kingdom advancing in you? Or will you remain stubborn, prideful, and selfish? Will you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and will you love your neighbor as yourself? Or will you be stubborn, prideful, and selfish? His kingdom is advancing. And one day there will be only one kingdom question is, will you be in it? And then, so then it leads me to my last question. Why put it off? I mean, essentially what we're doing when we resist, when, we, when, when life presses against us, when God's kingdom presses against us and we resist, we are putting it off being part of his kingdom why are we waiting will we uh, live a life of surrender to him would you pray with me please Lord Jesus as, uh, as I look at this passage and, and I, I, I want to thank you for just the, 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 what you're talking to me about Sometimes the, the things that I encounter during my day are, are seem almost ridiculous that I get upset about, that I get frustrated with. And if I can begin to see you at work, to begin to see you revealing to me that I'm not surrendered to you. I want to be absorbed into your kingdom. that we would be a people, whoever's listening to this, that we would be a 
people that are, is, that are completely surrendered to you. Each day, we're surrendering to your, your kingdom, your sovereignty, your kingship. May you be Lord of our lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Well, once again, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, um, hey, if I haven't heard from you in a while, reach out, please, okay? I uh, hope you're doing okay. And uh, love to hear from you.